Hello and welcome to the last part of this long repair-a-thon. As I unpacked the box back then, I didn't expect that this will take so much time to get through the content, but I was very busy lately and could only progress very slowly. Anyway, today I'm finally going to finish this long run and we'll talk about the two last Socket 7 boards which were in that box as well. First, let's take a look at the Gigabyte GA586ATE-P, one very widely used board with the Intel 430FX chipset, commonly known as the Intel Triton 1 or simply the FX chipset. If you watch my channel regularly, this board will probably remind you on something. This connector. It's meant to be used with a voltage regulator module, which made it possible to use dual voltage CPUs in this board, like the Intel MMX or AMD K6. Well, almost a year ago I presented my VRM project, a module which I designed to plug into such mainboards to provide additional voltage to the board. The module did work, but was not perfect and I wanted to redesign it to get more power out of it. Well, I didn't forget my promise to open source the solution and, as you see, I made another prototype which should be a lot better, but I ran into stability issues. I needed more time for investigations, but unfortunately I had to put this project on pause, since this was and still is a very bad year for so many of us. My help is needed elsewhere and I had to sacrifice my hobby partially. I promise you that as soon as I have more time again, I will come back to it, finalize this project and eventually open source the solution. So far, thank you for your patience. And in case you don't know what I'm talking about, maybe you are interested to go through my videos about this connector. On this board, in the connector is only one jumper set and some pins are bent. Probably other jumpers simply fell off the bent pins and got lost. Luckily this board has no barrel battery, which could leak and destroy the PCB, but an RTC module. It is even socketed and can be easily replaced with one of my custom RTC modules. One of the capacitors seemed to be ripped off and has to be replaced as well. One corner on the memory slot is broken, but I think the memory module would still sit well in it. This is not critical. Just as usual, we also have some bent pins. Well, as I said, in the VRM connector there was only one jumper. It would work, but it is better to install at least two jumpers to distribute the current flow over the pins and protect the traces underneath from burning through. Again, if you don't know what this is for, watch my other videos about this VRM connector. Ok, let's see if this thing is working. I have here an Intel Pentium 100 CPU. By the way, who had the great idea to put the IDE connectors right below the CPU? This is the lower part of the mainboard, usually. And imagine how the ribbon cables would go up over the CPU. What a stupid design! It would cover the CPU cooler and totally impact the airflow. I can only imagine this board in a non-standard case where the board has to be installed upside down, but for a normal layout this is a really strange location. Ok, now the jumpers. A 100MHz CPU runs uh, with front side bus of 66MHz and multiplier of 1.5. The jumper JP6 has to be completely open, and it is. And the front side bus is set up to 66 MHz as well. Very nice. Oh, I forgot to take a look from the other side. Yeah, there are some nasty scratches indeed. Oh, and look at that. The PCI slot holder, which is made out of metal, is touching one of the pins. That could theoretically end up in a short, depending if these stands in the slots are internally connected to the ground or not. Uh, in any case, this should not touch any solder joints at all.
Ok, these scratches seem not to be critical. There is still continuity on all of the crossed traces. Now just in case, let's remove the CPU briefly and double check the voltage once again. Three point five volts on the voltage regulator, and also three point five volts in the VRM connector. That looks good. Okay, uh, let's put back the CPU and give it a try. I'll also install the post and Liza card. Yay, and some numbers are running. That means that this board is alive at least to some extent. Let's add some memory and the PC speaker and see if it will complain about a missing graphics adapter. And it does. This sound means that the memory test was successful and the graphics card detection failed. Let's add a graphics card, I would say. And here we go, this board seems to be working so far. But it still needs some love. First of all, it needs a new capacitor. I would like not to put it under stress with the ripped off capacitor. Second, this board complains about the empty battery in the RTC module. No wonder after so many years. Luckily, the RTC module on this board is already socketed, so let's replace the module with one of my NW3287 custom replacements. You can also find a video about this one on my channel, if you need more information about it. And we are ready to go! I'll also add a compact flash to IDE adapter, maybe we will be able to get into DOS already. So the battery error is gone, the compact flash adapter was detected. The floppy drive is not connected, so let's ignore the error message and continue. And we are in DOS. This board needed some love indeed, but all in all, it is a working one, what is very nice, since it has a VRM module slot and now I have another exemplar which I could use for my VRM tests. And now to the last board of this long repairathon. A socket 7 mainboard QDI P5i430VX-250DM. As I searched for it on the retro web, I found it funny that this board has 250DM in its name. That sounds like 250 Deutschmark, German mark, which could be a reasonable price for this mainboard as it was introduced. Unfortunately, I didn't find this board in the price lists from that time, but if you had this board back then, I'd be curious to know what it costed. The name would be a funny coincidence. Anyway, I already took a closer look at this board and it is visually and technically in a good shape. On the back there are some slight scratches, but they are all only on the surface. Otherwise, the board looks as good as new. This board is very interesting and quite unusual for its time. It is based around the 430VX chipset and it already supports dual voltage for the MMX and K6 CPUs. But that is not what is so unusual about it. I used a Pentium MMX 166 for testing and after I inserted the CPU I started to search for the jumpers to set up the frontside bus, voltage and multiply. The settings were mentioned on the board. But to my surprise, I didn't find any jumpers at all. Instead, there were rows of unpopulated holes where jumpers should be. This caught me by surprise, to be honest. And it was the moment where I realized that this board was not quite as usual as I thought. 
Looking once again at the retro web, I found two entries for this board. One with so-called speed easy feature and the other without it. And suddenly I understood that this was one of the first jumperless mainboards as we know them today. Setting the CPU voltage or frontside bus clock in BIOS is nothing special today, but in the mid-90s this was a very hot feature hands down. So I added some memory and a graphics card and simply powered up the system. It instantly worked, and apart from speed easy logo, a message about a detected Pentium MMX 125 MHz smiled at me. That was obviously wrong, so I entered the BIOS and found an unusual menu entry, speed easy CPU setup. In there I could select between various presets or combinations for the frontside bus and the multiplier with up to 200 MHz in total. Unfortunately, the board didn't want to save the settings because the battery was dead. So I added a new battery and set the CPU frequency to 166 MHz with 66 MHz frontside bus and 2.5 multiplier in BIOS. The system saved the BIOS settings and after a reboot, the CPU was eventually reported as 166 MHz one. Microsoft DOS worked also out of the box and the system delivered performance which was usual for a 166 MHz CPU. Doom ran also stable and ended the time demo with almost exactly 1000 real ticks, or 74 frames per second. I didn't connect the CPU fan to the power supply, but after the short test the CPU didn't get hot. However, this board has also one very bad drawback. It had an outdated linear voltage regulator circuit to power the CPU and it was heavily inefficient emitting a lot of heat. The temperature of the heat sink on the voltage regulators went over 80 degrees Celsius, which is quite high. That is why it was and it is important to have a running CPU fan on this board, not only to cool down the CPU, but also the voltage regulators nearby. It is also important to use a CPU cooler, which has holes coming out to the side, like here. Otherwise, no air would flow over the voltage regulators and they would simply overheat. If you ask me, this is really a bad design. I think if the manufacturer introduces such a modern feature like jumperless configuration, they could also introduce a more modern CPU power supply circuits using a switching voltage regulator. But, well, once again, it is clearly visible that this board is from the time of big changes and is historically very interesting. Luckily, on the retro web, I found the latest BIOS for this board and flashed it directly from the compact flashcard. After the reboot, the CPU speed was set back to 125 MHz. But in the BIOS there were suddenly new options to choose from. I could select between a detailed jumper emulation and speed easy, where only the final CPU speed could be set up. In the jumper emulation mode now I could select the frontside bus and multiply separately. In addition to that, 75 MHz frontside bus clock was added to the list and this board became an overclocker paradise. With a multiplier of 3.5 and 75 MHz, it could theoretically overclock the CPU to 260 MHz. But I guess that would be too much for the mentioned linear voltage regulator. Anyway, just for the experiment, I set the CPU first to standard 166 MHz and repeated some tests in DOS. The performance was the same as before with uh, the old BIOS. Then I entered the BIOS once again and set up 75 MHz frontside bus instead of 66 MHz. The system booted and was absolutely stable. It could finalize all my tests and was about 15 to 20% faster.
Well, despite that I didn't have to repair anything on this board, I found it really interesting. I think this is the earliest board with jumperless configuration feature which I ever held in my hands. I always thought that it started later with slot 1, socket 370 and socket A, but here is the evidence that it was already possible on the socket 7 too. Well, and this was my big repairathon, which I did over the last three months. Quite a lot of mainboards, and only one of them couldn't be repaired because of the physically damaged graphics chip. Well, I'm not too sad about this one. It was not the most exciting board in the box anyway. Furthermore, it will be definitely useful as a donor. So I'm super happy having those other 286, 386, slot 1 and Super Socket 7 boards repaired and I hope you enjoyed this long run with me. Should you have missed one of the repairs, feel free to watch them. And I hope to see you on my channel again. Thank you for watching and goodbye.